So today we are going to look at uh, gender analysis and we are going to look at what is gender analysis, what gender analysis examines, how to choose a framework. We're going to look at three frameworks, the Harvard framework, the Moser framework, the Women Empowerment frameworks. We're going to look at the origins of the frameworks, the details, the strengths and weaknesses. What is gender analysis? Gender analysis is the systematic use of gender frameworks to analyze social gender power relations within a given context. Gender analysis is composed of various concepts, and these concepts derive from theory. Now, gender analysis is usually done through tools, and these tools are usually participatory. Now, you have to understand that not every context will have the same set of gender problems. So it's important to do a gender analysis instead of assuming what the problem is going to be. Uh, men and women suffer differently in different contexts. So gender analysis helps us identify the gender gap. What is the gender gap within this specific context? And then not only does it help us identify the gender gaps, it also gives us a clue as to what would be the most appropriate means of filling these gender gaps. Now, it also communicates information on gender when you do gender analysis, because in the process of doing gender analysis, you are collecting data, you are educating people, and then also the feedback you get from gender analysis, you also communicate it. Now, it is used to also assess institutional gender sensitivity and capacity. So uh, you can even run a gender analysis of GIJ. Is GIJ gender sensitive? You know, you can run uh, of your office. Is your news media, you are working for gender sensitive, do, do they understand gender issues, what's their capacity, right? And then you can also intervene to ad address gender imbalance. So if you don't do gender analysis, then you cannot understand what the problem is, and then you cannot address the problem by, but 
by understanding the problem, then you are able to now finally address the problem. So now there are many frameworks when it comes to gender analysis, but the first generation frameworks are the Harvard Analytical Framework, also known as the Gender Rules Framework, and then the MOSA Framework. And then you come to the second generation and then you also have the social relations approach, gender analysis matrix, women empowerment framework, and then the capabilities and vulnerability analysis frameworks. Some other frameworks include participatory raw appraisal, rapid raw appraisal techniques, uh, complementary gender analysis, sector specific and country specific frameworks. So we have a lot of frameworks and this list is by no means exhaustive. Uh, you have Harvard, MOSA, Women Empowerment, Gender Analysis Matrix, Human Capability Approach, Social Relations Approach, People Oriented Planning, Social and Economic Gender Analysis, and there are, there are many more, so you look out for them and try and use them in your work in future. So how do we choose a tool for our gender analysis? First of all, we have to look at the tools at our disposal. And so it means we have to examine the frameworks. Each framework has a set of tools and within these tools uh, address specific concepts. So you have to look at what the frameworks are saying and what the tools under the framework is seeking to achieve. Now, different frameworks have different goals. You know, in some frameworks, the goal is to examine social roles and responsibilities, whilst others, uh, you know, seek to examine social relationships within a given society. Now, some uh, frameworks are there to reform the gender status quo, and basically, to reform the gender status quo means that you do not challenge power dynamics within the society. You are just there to slightly improve the conditions of uh, women and other marginalized groups, but you do not really challenge uh, the, the power dynamics uh, within that uh, community or setting. And then some frameworks or some tools under the framework seek to transform the gender status quo, which means that it seeks to uh, empower women, take them from a position of subordination and uh, bring them to par with men. Now also some uh, frameworks are more concerned about um, economic efficiency. How do we tap into the potentiality of uh, women and other uh, marginalized groups and all that? So the focus of that a framework or that uh, tool and uh, that specific framework will be to promote the efficiency of uh, women. And then some frameworks also seek to empower women. So uh, these are things that um, depending on the framework, uh, the framework will do or not do. Now also you realize that some frameworks do not explore masculinities at all whilst others uh, allow and give room uh, for uh, masculinities to be explored. So it's important, depending on the work you are doing, if you think that masculinity is also a factor, uh, then you, you know that you have to look for an, a more appropriate um, tool to address that issue. And then also flexibility. So the truth is that uh, every situation is unique every context is different and so depending on what you are trying to do you need some flexibility so it, it means that you don't pick just let's say one framework mosa framework and say that okay i'm only going to work with mosa framework neither do you pick only let's say harvard framework and say i'm going to work with only harvard framework or a social relations approach or um a women empowerment framework depending on what you are doing you may have to go and pick you know a number of tools from the women empowerment framework or pick a number of tools from the uh, 
uh, Mosa framework and what have you. Now, um, so that's the whole point of flexibility in order to compensate for limitation given in, in one particular framework. So you can mix the frameworks to achieve your goal. So you have to also uh, be mindful that there are a lot of cross-cutting issues that affect the, the 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 two genders. You know, you have age, class, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation. So if you are um, going to do a gender analysis, you're going to uh, look at what pertains within a given context. You have to be mindful of these things because. Um, People in different age groups need different things. People in different classes have different uh, gender needs. People in different religions have different gender needs. Sexual orientation have different gender needs. And this um, has been referred to as inter in, in intersectionality. So the whole idea about inter intersectionality is that there are so many cross-cutting issues at play at every given time like for example if you uh, look at uh, Barack Obama he's a, a black president he was a black president of the US and all that Barack Obama does not suffer the same um, problems that other black men in America suffer so if let's say you are from the the, the ghetto or the slums or the project and, uh, and you are black and then uh, he is black but he was born and raised in o o Hawaii and you know he got a good education lived a different life then you realize that even though they are black men their experiences are not the same so well in doing gender analysis we have to be mindful that uh, just because uh, a person appears to be in a particular um, gender or a particular uh, social group doesn't mean that um, their issues are all the same, right? So it's something that uh, you have to be mindful. Of. So when you are doing gender analysis, you are you are asking yourself that okay, who exactly am I targeting? Uh, because you are not targeting all men in gender analysis, you know. Are you when you are trying to change the situation? Which men are you looking at? Which girls are you looking at? Which boys are you looking at? Which women are you looking at? Tools to use for your gender analysis is going to be influenced by the task that's to be performed, right? So if you are doing a gender analysis of a policy, the tools that you use may be different from if you are doing a gender planning. Um, gender budgeting or gender monitoring and evaluation. So the task at hand is, is very important. And then the context, depending on how much information you have, uh, certain uh, tools may be more practical than others. For example, if you don't have a lot of information on as to what pertains on the ground, you cannot really use the social relations approach. But with the Harvard approach, even if you don't have much information on the ground, you can use it to find information and then uh, come and do your analysis. And that also depends on the available resources. If you uh, have a huge budget, then you can make use of more tools and more uh, demanding tools. But if you have a small budget, like uh, you do when you are doing a the gender analysis of a policy, then it also requires a different set of tools. And then also, what's the goal you, you, you want to achieve, right? So if you want to achieve empowerment of women, then yes, uh, the women framework by long way is preferable. But if you want to, let's say, uh, uh, potentially change the gender uh, power dynamics and all that there may be the social relations approach and the uh, uh, most of framework may be uh, more suited to uh, w your needs if let's say you don't want to uh, you want to reform the system then maybe the Harvard framework but these are all things that uh, 
to look at in the uh, sub when we go a bit deeper into the frameworks and then also the possible reaction of the target group you know if you are in a very hostile environment then you know certain frameworks and tools may not be ideal for you so the first framework we are going to look at closely is the harvard framework so the harvard analytical framework also known as the gender roles framework was the first framework developed for gender analysis it was developed in 1985 by harvard institute of international development in partnership with uh, the women in development office of usaid now the whole purpose of the harvard analytical framework is to make an economic case for equal distribution of resources between male and female now the whole idea is that if we are able to map up the differences the kind of resources that are at women's disposal and that and that are at men's disposal then we'll be able to know okay what kind of resources we can possibly give women so that they can also um, achieve the same economic potentiality as men so it's trying to uh, gain some sort of uh, efficiency uh, from women by providing women with uh, access to certain uh, resources that they lack now the harvard framework consists of four tools for gender analysis so, so the harvard analytical framework uses a number of matrix tables and a series of questions to collect information at the household and community level now the harvard framework is made up of four tools the first tool has to do with the activity profile who does what in this given community then tool two which is access and control profile looks at who has access to what resources and who has control over resources now you realize that in every community there are certain beliefs norms values that influence uh, who does what and um, who has control over certain resources so as a result these things are influencing factors so two three looks at what are these influencing factors what are the constraints what are the opportunities what are the required inputs and then two four is a, is, is a checklist basically and two four has a series of questions that allow you to collect a gender disaggregated data the first tool in the Harvard framework is the activity profile and the activity profile simply looks at who does what in a given society. So if you have a fishing community, who catches the fish, who dries the fish, who smokes the fish, who sells the fish, you know, these are our activities. In a farming community, who grows the food crops, who grows the cash crops, who sells the food crops, who sells the cash crops. These are our activities. Now, the second tool has to do with access and control. Now, you realize that even though um, women have access to resources, often they don't have control over the resources. For example, in Ghana, because of our land tenure system, uh, men have control over land and most women do not have that kind of control they they have access to land to farm but they do not have control over the land in, in terms of being able to use the land uh, as collateral for loans being able to sell the land if they want to make money their 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 access to land is tied to uh, 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 use rights basically so Harvard 2.3 is about influencing factors 
For example, if you take the uh, movie Mulade and you look at that community, the issue of FGM, right? What are the influencing factors for FGM? You have uh, cultural beliefs, you know, the norms, the values. And then within these cultural beliefs and norms and values, which ones are the constraints uh, to uh, tackling FGM? So you say, okay, a woman who is not cut becomes promiscuous. So this this is a norm that constraints uh, a woman. But for example, if you look at the mulade that uh, the lady evoked to protect the young girl, this is also a cultural thing but it also presents an opportunity to also protect the women so you, you have to look at the influencing factors and see okay well, what are the constraints within these influencing factors what are the opportunities so if you have okay legal systems within the community and all that how can we use the legal system to improve a uh, situation how do the legal system maybe currently harm the situation or make the situation worse and then the the fourth tool is really about uh, asking a series of questions to uh, capture you know gender disaggregated data you know to see the effect of social change on both male and females so now to the strength and weakness of the harvard framework so the harvard framework is non-threatening by saying non-threatening, we mean that it does not uh, seek to transform the gender status quo. So what does that mean? So to transform the gender status quo means that you are looking at the power dynamics within the community and you are, you are trying to make sure that uh, men and women have more equal uh, power within the community. But with this framework, it doesn't really look, care that much about power dynamics. It doesn't really care about as, uh, women being subordinated uh, that much. It does not its focus really. So it does not really threaten the the the, the status quo, you know. So uh, it's it's non-threatening, and then relies on facts and not theory. So on this point, you know, it's a set of tools. So you are going to see the situation on the ground. So it, it, it does not have like a, a theory that's guiding its thinking. It is going to pick what is on the ground and use it to inform what uh, to do, right? And then in this framework, you realize that it uh, talks about what do uh, women do what do men do and all that so it gives visibility and uh, allows us to know the gendered division of labor within that community and then another thing that works well is that it's very simple to use it's very straightforward so uh, it's part of the strength of the framework but the weakness you know uh, as i said earlier it's it's about okay let's see where women lack access to resources let's see how we can um, give them more so that they can uh, produce more so it's more of like a, a capitalist perspective on things it doesn't really care about uh, uh, gender uh, power dynamics and all that and then it's reform is reformist so when they say reformist it means that uh, it's coming to improve the life of women all right but it is not here to you know put women on an equal footing with men you can say so if for example um, the woman is in her house with her husband the husband uh, controls her finances and everything when the husband has you know uh, fish she sells it and all that and then now you've given her a skill to make more money and all that. If it's not transformational, what happens is that when she gets the money from the new skill you have given her and all that, she's just going to give the money to the husband. So you haven't like changed the situation, but you've just created like 
another means of uh, uh, exploiting hair or something like that. So it's like here is like oh, let's teach them how to do hairdressing. You know, let us you know, but you don't really change uh, their lives in terms of their position within the uh, you know the gender hierarchy you know is like they are not on equal footing with men and then you know another weakness is that it 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 tends to focus only on women where the men you know in this framework it's it's it's, it's thinking about how do we improve women's uh, efficiency and all that but uh, you know that gender and development is not just about women it's about men and women as well and and then it also doesn't give any suggestions out as to uh, a follow-up so the next framework we are going to look at is the MOSA framework so when we discussed the Harvard framework we said that it was developed by the Harvard Institute for international development in collaboration with the women in development office of usaid now the the women in development here speaks to a feminist approach to development and women in development is basically saying that women have been ignored in the development process so we should include women in development so you realize that the harvard framework is really about let let us uh, add women uh, to the development process, you know, and then everything will be all right. But the MOSA framework, uh, it's kind of like a reaction to the Harvard framework, and it 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 comes from a gender and development uh, uh, approach to uh, development. It finds its uh, theoretical uh, underpinning in socialist uh, feminism and it, it introduces the concept of subordination to uh, the planning process. Now uh, the MOSA framework is mostly used to uh, for development planning and it is useful uh, uh, to as a training tool and to sensitize uh, people on issues of uh, development. Now, the MOSA framework assumes that planning is both uh, political and technical in nature. And it assumes that because planning is uh, political and technical, there's always going to be a conflict in the planning process. There's going to be political and institutional resistance towards planning. And then the BOSA framework also assumes that uh, planning is a transformatory process. So you, you do planning to transform the gender uh, status quo. And it's also saying that planning is a debate. So you are looking at you know, a discussion, an ongoing discussion between all parties as to how best uh, to um, change the the current situation so in that sense planning is a debate now the MOSA framework also known as the levy framework uh, is comprised of six activities or tools and the major concepts in this framework is the triple role practical and strategic gender needs and then also the weight and guard policy approaches so women in development versus uh, gender and development policy approaches so identification and Mosa makes mention of pro over resources right and it's asking who controls what who decides what and you know how is resources distributed uh, within uh, uh, the society so, for example, if you look at agrarian societies in Ghana, you realize that women have used rights. They can use land to uh, farm, you know, but they cannot, uh, they don't have control rights, so they cannot sell 
the farmland they cannot use it uh, as collateral to access loans and all that so uh, the control of that economic resource being land is held by men and so this uh, leads to uh, men always having the power because they they are the ones who control the finances and so if you do not sing to their tune then they do not uh, share in the resources with you so this is uh, an example of um, um, the result of someone doing uh, a gender analysis in an agrarian society and seeing that okay uh, this is how uh, uh, the control of resource and decision making you know uh, leads to inequality in uh, the agrarian society so you you realize that in uh, uh, many uh, households uh, the decision power is held by uh, men especially when it comes to key things and all that so this uh, tool really wants to understand okay what uh, do women control what do men control uh, you know how are resources distributed is it distributed in a fair manner uh, you know so if you are in your house and then your older brother gets a bigger piece of the meat simply because he's your older brother or you know uh, when it comes to inheritance they give uh, most of the land to the male and all that then you realize that okay resource distribution is uh, uh, not uh, fair and so this tool is like okay let us try and see and understand uh, how the resources are shared who makes the decision and then we'll know the situation and how best we can approach the situation right and then also the fourth tool is saying that how can we balance the triple roles so you realize that uh, women have three roles they are they are looking after their households they are looking after uh, they are they are participating um, economically and then they also play social roles so okay so uh, you realize that maybe your mom is balancing uh, looking after her household with her office work and then maybe with her church uh, responsibility you know as well you know your cousin's wedding she has to go and uh, help you know you, there's a funeral she has to go and help and you know all these things these are all uh, social roles as well so um, this photo is basically saying that when you are designing a development intervention right you have to be mindful that women play multiple roles so this intervention that you are coming to do is it coming to increase their burden or uh, uh, you know and leave them worse off or it's going to actually improve their situation so if i'm a mother that i am spending uh, uh, 10 hours a day looking after uh, multiple children and then you say you are coming to teach me how to uh, uh, sew or whatever you know this uh, new um, intervention that you are doing uh, is it going to benefit me am i going to now uh, have more stress on me because i am taking an additional role you can say so if, like for example uh, you realize that when we are talking about care economy uh, we uh, said that uh, women do a lot of the household work but they are also working in the corporate you know sector they are also you know working in the economy and all that so at the end of the day yeah, spending more time working both household and uh, office and or uh, selling and all, all that you know than men so there's that inequality so they are more stressed out they are more tired and all that so you realize that uh, in some society some women are saying that look i cannot combine office life and then 
uh, household life and so some will say that okay I, in fact I don't want this the stress so uh, I'm leaving the work environment the economic environment to focus on my uh, household um, activities right and then you also realize that some women realize that okay um, my the task of looking after the household and then also working as well uh, makes it uh, a very difficult balancing act so they will say that okay you know what? I don't want to get married I don't want to have children because uh, it will affect my ability to perform well in the economic sphere and this is what I want to do so when you are you are planning you have to plan in such a way that um, it does not make uh, women worse off they shouldn't have to uh, be burdened with uh, their current activity and then you add more to their plate in the name of uh, helping them you have to make sure that your intervention is something that they can uh, balance with their other activities as well so it does not mean that um, because um, uh, they are doing a, a reproductive work let us not stress them by uh, bringing a, a intervention no it doesn't mean that it means that this intervention that we are bringing have we analyzed uh, it critically have we thought about it is this something that they can easily do in addition in addition to what they currently do or is this something that do it means that um, in order to do they need to uh, offload their uh, household responsibility to other women as well so you have to uh, ask yourself the question that uh, can the intervention be balanced with the other roles and responsibilities the women play within that given uh, society So the fifth Mosa tool is making the argument that different. The Mosa tool six right talks about involving women in gender aware organization and planners in planning. Now, why is this important? So you have to realize that if you are planning for development, whatever is in the plan is what gets executed. So if you want a plan that is going to be gender sensitive, then it also needs the perspective of women and gender aware organization and planners. So it means that you have to involve uh, uh, women, women's groups, uh, gender aware organize, organization in as uh, stakeholders in the planning process. So not only should they be there as uh, stakeholders that we've invited them to uh, uh, talk about a new policy we are doing or a new uh, plan we want to execute and all that. He's saying that uh, women and uh, gender aware organizations should be part of the definition of the goals of uh, the policy or the program or the development intervention they should be involved in the analysis they should be involved in the implementation of the project and everything the idea is that by involving all these uh, gender aware stakeholders and women in the entire process you come up with a, a, a policy or a program or a plan you know or you know or a project that is uh, gender sensitive uh, gender aware and that speaks to the strategic the practical and the strategic gender needs of uh, women in society so let us examine the strengths of the Mosa framework the Mosa framework moves gender planning from a purely technical exercise to a political and technical one and it is political because it brings the issue of women's subordination into the planning process.
It is also potentially transformatory because it helps us assess the potential impact of intervention on gender relations. It is also potentially transformatory because if done right, it empowers women so that women can enjoy the same human rights as men. Another good, another good thing about the MOSA framework is that it let us, it helps us identify the underlining assumptions behind projects that are being taken. And when we talk about underlining assumptions, we are looking at the 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 issues of uh, welfare, equity, empowerment, anti-poverty. Uh, it, that it allows us to and that uh, identify what the goal of a particular project or the underlying assumption of a particular project is. Let us examine the weaknesses of the MOSA framework. So the MOSA framework uh, loses its political edge by trying to gain legitimacy among development planners. Uh, at that time, and one could argue even now, most development planners were not gender sensitive. And so MOSA in seeking to make to make sure that uh, gender issues were considered, spoke in a language that these development planners could understand. But the consequence of that action was that the complexity of uh, gender power relations, the to and fro of bargaining, the cooperation and the conflict was not adequately captured in her framework. Now, Musa mentions uh, uh, triple roles, but in these triple roles, she fails to mention the gender power relationships in these triple roles. Okay, so women do reproductive work, they do uh, productive work, they do social and community work. But what are the gender dynamics in each and every role? In this respect, MOSA framework fails because it does not analyze the gender power relationships within these triple roles. In addition, the conceptual division between strategic and practical gender needs are murky, it's not clear, and it seems artificial. Another weakness of the MOSA framework is that it fails to highlight other forms of differences such as class, race, and ethnicity. And then finally, because the MOSA framework is focused almost entirely on women, it ignores men as gendered beings. So often in development, we hear the phrase, we need to empower women and girls. But what does it mean to empower someone? How does one empower someone how do you know what you are doing will help women become empowered the women empowerment framework helps makes practical the concept of empowerment and equality and helps us look critically at development interventions and its capability to empower women now this framework was developed in Zambia by the Zambian Sara Longwe and the whole ideology behind this framework is women empowerment to empower women. Now uh, Sara Longwe believed that uh, once we allow women and men to have equal participation in the development of uh, the, the country uh, and and we give them equal access and control over the factors of production, then women will be finally able to empower themselves. So behind uh, Sarah's framework is this idea that there's levels to equality. And we'll look at uh, it in more detail in the subsequent slides. But there are two main tools that uh, she developed to analyze women empowerment. And the first tool looks at uh, how, you know, well, you know, it assesses how development uh, 
uh, planning or interventions or uh, policy promotes uh, women empowerment. And then the second tool examines the extent to which women issues are recognized in the development uh, plan program you know uh, intervention uh, policy what have you so the first two and the uh, language framework is levels of equality and it assesses uh, the extent to which women are gaining equality with men in five levels and these levels are welfare access conscientization participation and control now what Longwe does is that she uses these levels of equality to assess women's empowerment because she believes that with increased levels of equality uh, women empowerment also you know the avenue for women empowerment also increases so now let's examine this framework you realize that this framework has two arrows one on the left one on the right and they are all pointing up now this is saying that with increased equality you have increase in empowerment here the lowest level for a development project or policy or um, program is welfare right and the highest is control right so if a development project or policy or outcome seeks to empower women then it must move beyond welfare and access and it should be uh, somewhere around control and you know participation you know it should take more boxes around those areas in order uh, to have the potential to um, empower women so under the first two of the women empowerment framework the first level is the welfare level now this is the lowest level uh, in this framework at this level women are seen as passive beneficiaries of development interventions here the focus is on the material welfare of women relative to men do the women have food supply do they have income do they have health care if they don't then let us just give it to them the next level has to do with access now the next level is saying that uh, if we give uh, women equal access to productive resources that is uh, land uh, labor uh, capital training then women will be able to start you know empowering themselves and you uh, the uh, the author of the framework basically says that you can achieve this through legal reform so you take the example of the pndc bill that uh, speaks to how inheritance should be shared uh, after the death of uh, a family member whereas previously the patriarchal system would uh, favor the men and make sure they get a greater portion of the wealth of the deceased person as a result of legal reform uh, now uh, children irrespective of their gender have you know equal access to productive resources so that's an example of using uh, legal reform to give women access to productive resources then the next level is uh, conscientization and here they are saying that does the uh, development project you know development intervention being planned does is, is there a clear distinction between the sex and gender roles you know because um, uh, sex is obviously different from gender by now you should know that and then also um, the concept of gender relations is it uh, is it fair is it um, uh, is it um, does it promote equality 
and then also the gender division of labor what uh, uh, men do what women do in a given society is it based on fairness and not uh, uh, domination by men you know it shouldn't subjugate uh, women basically so the next two levels has to do with participation and control so here with participation we are saying that women are equal participants in decision making you know they are equal participants in policy uh, making planning and administration and you know in every project we do uh, needs assessment you know we design the project we implement and we evaluate so if you want your project to you know be gender sensitive and you know uh, gender aware then you need um, to have women throughout the whole planning you know implementation and evaluation cycle of the project now control means that uh, women you know participation in decision making uh, have, you know it translates into balanced control over the factors of production so here at control level it doesn't mean that uh, the men are uh, now being subjugated no it means that uh, women you know have the same you know level of control over uh, uh, the factors of production as men do. The second tool of the Women Empowerment Framework looks at the level of recognition of women's issues. Here the concern is whether you know the development projects objectives or the development plan or you know or the uh, policy uh, recognizes, you know, women's issue or it ignores it. Another thing is that also the relationship between men and women often require, uh, often leads to women uh, being subordinated. So any project that wants to empower women has to also examine the relationship between men and women within that given community and see what the power relationship is and if it is one of subordination then take action to um, uh, address that um, issue to 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 make sure that women are more equal uh, are equal to men now there are three levels of recognition of women issues the negative level which means is bad crap the negative level says that project objectives are silent about women issues now what happens is that if you have a policy or a project or a plan that does not mention women's issues then basically what, what happens at the end of the day is that in the implementation uh, only men are going to benefit because the implementers are men and you know every, everything is uh, the whole structure and system benefits men so if you don't make a conscious effort to uh, bring up women's issues and all that then it will be totally ignored and then uh, the 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 policy or program that would uh, be implemented is largely going to uh, benefit men more than women then the neutral level you realize that okay they've made mention of some uh, women issues but you know their concern is uh, neutral it's uh, conservative and here yeah, they are just uh, making sure that women are not worse than before the last level which is the positive level is looking at um, the relationship between men and women and here yeah, it's saying that if a project is at a positive level if a policy or a plan is at a positive level then it is uh, it concerns itself with trying to change the relationship between uh, uh, men and women and move it uh, from domination and you know of women and you know subjugation of uh, women to one where women are more um, have greater uh, uh, rights and are equal to men in society.
So the two tools of the uh, Women Empowerment Framework can be combined and uh, looked at in one matrix as seen here, or it can be separated into two separate matrices. So let us look at the strengths and weaknesses of the Women Empowerment Framework. So beginning with the strength, the, the Women's Empowerment Framework gives us a useful tool for examining what empowerment is. Empowerment is a, is a concept that is quite difficult to understand and this framework makes it practical and gives us a way of measuring whether empowerment is actually happening. Another strength is that this framework, if used well, it can be potentially transformatory. If your project, policy or plan moves beyond welfare and allows for more participation and more control from women, then the unequal gender relations that exist in that society will be transformed. Often we hear people say that, oh, we are empowering these people, we are doing this and doing that, but how do you measure the empowerment that you are you are giving to the people so this framework uh, let us uh, see if uh, we are actually practicing what we are we are preaching it's not just uh, rhetoric but actually empowerment is taking place on the ground now looking at the weaknesses of the women empowerment framework first of all when you think of um, equality in hierarchies then it's a bit problematic because when you look at um, her framework she she gives the impression that okay uh, uh, control is better than participation and participation you know but it is it isn't actually the case for example if you have control over the development process Right, but you do not have, let's say, access to land. So let's say there's a development project and you are uh, giving out uh, cutlass and hoes and you are you, the women have control in this project and all that. So they uh, are able to get the cutlass and hoes and all that. If they don't have access to land, which is right just above a uh, welfare level, then it, it, it doesn't work the empowerment doesn't work so it gives that wrong you know idea that okay uh, things that are higher up you know in the equality uh, ladder that she created is better than things below when in actual fact uh, a project that really is going to empower would um, would would have some element of access, will have some element of conscientization, will have some element of participation, you know, and, you know, control. So uh, it's it's not uh, a linear uh, relationship, but uh, you may come away from the framework thinking that uh, it's a linear relationship between the levels of uh, equality and as a, uh, an empowerment. Also, another weakness of this framework is that the levels, you know, the distinction between the levels are very hard to delineate. Uh, like, is there a clear distinction between uh, control and participation? Where does control begin and where does uh, participation and for instance it's, it's a, a bit difficult to de delineate the various uh, uh, barriers between the levels of equality because in in practice you realize that it flows right so at, at, you may have some participation and some control you know and all that so it's it's a bit blurred the lines between um uh, the barriers between these uh, the levels of equality. Now, another weakness of this framework is that because it's seeking to empower women, right, it doesn't look at uh, uh, gender relationships, right? There's it really doesn't really focus on the relationships between 
uh, male and female is really looking at is your project putting in measures to empower females that's basically it now uh, both the positive and the weakness of the woman the women empowerment framework is that it's strongly ideological you know the women empowerment framework is so dedicated you know to overcoming a woman's inequality in every aspect to men and so it, it it's actually positive in that regard because it's trying to achieve greater uh, uh, equality between the the sexes but you know the weakness of this framework is that because it's too committed to women's empowerment you know it, 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 it is often not picked by uh, development practitioners who think that it's um, it's too controversial it's uh, it's too women focused and you know it, 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 it may not get the support when it comes to uh, implementation of the framework they see it as controversial and you know confrontational and they do not want to uh, use the framework because of a strongly ideological uh, stance so that's the strength and weakness of the women empowerment framework being ideological so how do we undertake gender analysis so to undertake gender analysis you have to use research methods and we use both quantitative and qualitative research methods in doing gender analysis but it's usually mainly qualitative the nature of doing gender analysis is that you are trying to capture a certain social reality and so this means getting the people who you are trying to capture their reality to be part of the process so that you can gather the data from them. So a quantitative research design that you would use to uh, do gender analysis would be survey. So you can use uh, interviews, whether a focus group or um, individual interviews, it could be structured or non-structured. You can use them to uh, collect uh, uh, data for your gender analysis. You can also do mapping of the community as part of getting information for gender analysis as well as document reviews. By having also informal conversations within the community, you are able to tap into the psyche of the people to understand them as they are, how they think and how they see the world. You can also, you know, stay within the community and observe the community practices as if you are an ethnographer. You can also make use of time use service to do gender analysis whereby you record what men and women do at each and every given hour of the day or maybe season to know if uh, the gendered uh, division of labor is um, fair or not fair and then you can also listen to oral histories to understand the people for example when mesha uh, wrote uh, masculinity singer and she also took account of the history of uh, the people right and basically these were oral traditions and cultures that were passed down in stories that uh, gave her a complete understanding of uh, what masculinity meant historically within that specific uh, community so you can use um, surveys, you know, uh, you know your questionnaires, uh, interviews. You can use mapping and documentary views, informal conversation, walking tours, you know, living in the community, time use surveys, oral histories, and all that to do a gender analysis of a given society or 
policy or plan or something like that. So to conclude, here are some points to keep in mind. There's a difference between gender analysis and looking exclusively at females. A gender analysis is not limited to the analysis of women as an object of research, but it is aimed at understanding the social construction of gender and to discover the difference in the problem being studied. There is also a difference between doing just a gender analysis and doing a feminist gender analysis. Gender analysis does not challenge the status quo. It argues that uh, inequality between the sexes, the sexes are a result of women making poor decisions because of wage gaps or because of sexual division of labor. It, it, it never actually goes to the root of the problem because it does not want to be uh, confrontational. On the other hand, feminist gender analysis identifies the root causes of women's subordination. It is done to challenge the gender status quo and to change the power dynamics in society to produce a more equal society, to produce gender equality between the sexes. So finally, uh, gender analysis tools are varied and they undergo you know, constant change. Uh, existing gender analysis tools undergo revisions and new tools are developed frequently. Each gender analysis tool comes with certain ideological and theoretical assumptions about women's equality. So one must be careful in selecting the tool he or she uses because different tools produce different outcomes for women attainment of equality. Finally, finally, some gender analysis tools are more political than others, are more uh, controversial than others. And, and so you have to be uh, mindful in selecting the tools because the tools you select will have uh, political implications and you must be aware of the implication of your choices. Thank you very much.